is like right around August, September, and then we turned on influencer marketing and podcast marketing in, in October. And we saw from Q4 2020 to Q1 2021, so just a three month period of time, our revenue in those stores doubled. Obviously we're diving into Olipop, which is a sparkling tonic, a healthy soda alternative, um, super tasty stuff. Steve over here is the head of growth. So Steve, welcome to the Johnny Johnny podcast. Why don't you give them, for the folks that don't know you, a quick intro about yourself and then we'll dive a bit deeper into Olipop. Yeah, awesome. Uh, thank you for having me. Of course. It's an honor. <laughs> We've been internet friends for a while. We finally got to meet finally, in person man. last yeah. week yeah. at an event in New York. And so yeah, my name's Steven Vigilante, also from New Jersey. Um, grew up a little, a little fat kid drinking soda and <laughs> eating chicken fingers. And um, I got into uh, venture capital in my early 20s. I was working at one of the first venture capital funds in the country, specifically investing in food and beverage startups. And I totally fell in love with it. I had gotten into health and wellness. I and luckily left the, the fat stage of my life. Um, but was always looking for products that were like good, healthier replacements to junk food. So Halo Top was like a classic example of the first high protein, low calorie ice cream that did very well and ended up selling. And um, I was in venture capital for a few years. I met a lot of great people, but I wanted to get onto the operating side of the industry. And so moved from San Francisco to Los Angeles to work at like a meal kit startup that, you know, recipe in a box, all the ingredients, you mm -hmm. prepare it at home. Um, business was a bit of a mess. They ended up raising, they raised about $45 million two months before I got there and they went, they were bankrupt about six months after I got there. So within like an eight month span, burned through $45 million and crazy story. I learned a lot about what not to do uh, and then started consulting. So I left there when it shut down, um, was looking to work with startups on kind of fundraising, go to market strategy, um, kind of that zero to one, I like to call it. And um, I just had, I had a lot of experience working with brands in that kind of size range. And the first two, or the first brand I was sent as at, right after I started my consulting business was uh, a pitch deck for this fiber, you know, high fiber, low sugar soda concept called Olipop. And every six months or so, I say, I, I, I see a pitch deck or a brand that I'm like, oh my God, this thing is different. Yeah. Cause I've seen enough businesses where I'm like, eh, that's a little different. That's kind of different, whatever. This one, I was like, someone can do cola and root beer and make it healthy and taste good billion dollar opportunity. Right. Um, so I ended up cold calling the founder. It was just like, I want to get involved. I want to help you guys raise money. Um, ended up kind of helping raise the first two and a half million dollars to get the business off the, off the ground. And then um, just kind of came on as like an early employee helping with everything from, you know, retail sales in LA and doing demos and events. And um, have just gotten kind of more and more involved as, as we've grown and ended up helping launch our e-commerce platform right at the end of 2019, happening right before COVID, and it really took off um, during COVID. So my role shifted to be more focused on digital marketing, paid acquisition, on the e-commerce side, talent sure. influencer partnerships, how I met you. Um, and you know, today we're now the fastest growing functional beverage brand in the United States. We've kind of grown from 10 to 40 people in the last year, and right. we've got incredible investors behind us. We're in 7,000 stores across the country. Um, and it's been the most fun, rewarding experience of my life. Wow, there's a, a, a lot to unpack there, but I wanted to start with, so take me back to, like you said, you get a ton of pitch decks that come across your table, I would assume. Some are just okay, some are good, and then this one really stood out. What was your, I guess, sell to the founder for him to know, okay, I need this dude Steve on my team? I kind of was just like, I have a bunch of <laughs> investor friends, that I think I could get this in front of. And um, it's like a tough thing to say no to as a pre-launch founder when you're raising money. It's like if someone comes to you and says, hey, I could help you raise the money you're looking right. for, you're generally open to that. And the way like compensation structures work in that world is like if you are successful and you make an introduction where the person ends up investing, then you get compensated. So it's like pretty you know, low risk, high reward in, in the sense of like if the person does what they say they're gonna do, you know, everybody's happy uh, in, in for, for, for the most part. And so that was kind of like, and I was like totally underpricing myself to be honest. I was just like, I will do anything to get involved to get with in. these guys. Cause yeah. I knew, I just like, I knew it. And they're both incredible. They're both super different to the co-founders. And there's a lot of stuff I look for in early stage brands in terms of like brand, founders, team, how they think about culture and people. And they had, they had it all. They'd come from a, not, I would say failed startup, but they had their prior venture was another so beverage. and. Yeah. It was a little ahead of its time. It was like in a glass bottle. It was like $4 instead of two forty nine, which is where we're at with Olipop. And they had gone through, they'd been through some shit, as had I. I'd just come off of a failed startup. And I kind of have a theory that like, 
to really be successful, you almost have to fail first. Um, a lot of people who just step right into success like are almost naive to like how bad things can be and what like bad partnerships can look like and what bad investors can look like. Um, and so David and Ben just like had that like that those battle wounds and they were like they knew the mistakes they made the first time around and they were like not going to make those again that second time around. Yeah, that uh, interesting and it brings me to I guess an analogy that one of my advisors gave me one time when I was going through some stuff with the uh, the edtech startup is you know it's great for the first time founder to hit a home run right that that's always an exciting time for him but it's not necessarily the best thing for that founder for the future right hitting singles and doubles and oftentimes striking out is actually what a founder needs to learn how when he does hit a home run to keep consistent a lot of these founders that hit it out of the park the first time they'll face failure the next time and they're like fucking shocked they don't know right. what to do after that 100%. so like you mentioned you've been through it they've been through it so it's sort of a perfect match how fast or how easy was it for you to be able to sort of live up to what you said you were going to do for them in terms of you came and said, I can raise you a ton of money. I can get you people that are going to you know, be partners or whatever it is. Um, was it easy for you to do or was that a struggle? Um, raising money is never easy. I, again, luck, preparation, opportunity, whatever that saying is. But I, I started working with the Olipop founders. Uh, maybe two months later, I just happened to get introduced to the founders of RX Bar. They had just sold to Kellogg for 600 million. They were looking to do angel investments. They were really interested in fiber. They'd been doing a bunch of research on fiber at RX and considering launching like a fiber That's pack awesome. bar. And I just kind of mentioned this like high fiber soda thing I was, I was working on. And uh, Peter, the co-founder there was like super interested. He, he's in Chicago. David from Olipop happened to be going to Chicago the next week to uh -oh. do a panel that Peter was at. They had dinner that night shook hands on a million dollar investment that night. And I'll never forget that call. I think it was October 9th, 2018. David <laughs> called me, he's like, they're in. They're gonna put a million dollars. We were only trying to raise a half a million dollars. And they were like, we're gonna put a million in. And it's one of those, it's a signal thing. When a, when a guy like that commits money to, to invest, um, you know, everybody else wants to come in now, oh, right? Sure. So that million turned into two and a half million. And that's sort of how we launched the business. And the dirty secret of beverage is it's a very expensive space. and. Um, everything costs money. It's low margin business. It's a really a volume game early on. And so having that kind of money early was allowed us to do things that most beverage brands can't do. And, and um, then we opened up in Los Angeles. We started selling in a very high end grocery store chain called Air One Market. It's probably the most influential small grocery retailer sure. in the country. And um, it just took off. It was the right place, right time. You know, people, you know, there's been this massive wave of, in, in, in kind of uh, popularity of sparkling water, you know, kombucha, you know, kind of an interesting space, but no one had done soda. Neither of those are soda. If you're a soda drinker, you're not drinking kombucha, no. and you maybe will try sparkling water, but you're like, damn, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't, this Something isn't it. And people, when people try Olipop, they're always skeptical. They're like, oh, it's going to be a sparkling water, it's going to be a kombucha in a can. And then they have the cola, they have the root beer, and like, holy shit, this tastes exactly like what I remember root beer t tasting like. Or for the Coke, the people who are still drinking Coke, they're like, this tastes like Coke. They're like, then they look at the ingredients like, wait, this is healthy. Yeah. And it, their mind gets blown. And that's sort of, you know, it's been a major key to our success is that we're going directly after soda. And we really were the first brand in the startup world to do that. So, okay. We also need to talk about how we met. I think that's We do. And we'll definitely get to that because that's, that's a cool story too. The beginning days, like you said, you raised a shit ton of money for that time. Definitely, come, you know, two point five million for a startup is, is which actually crazy. is not. It's that not that much. much. That's why I sort of backtracked. Yeah. But for them, yeah. they were trying to raise five hundred thousand. So, yeah. like, blown away. What did that, you know, take me through like the first the first days, and what did that money allow you to do that you wouldn't have been doing if you didn't have it? So I, I do. I, I explain this a lot. We we stayed only in retail, only in California for the first. Uh, in, in, for the entire first 15 months of the business, which surprises people. A lot of brands think you gotta go really wide, you gotta grow as fast as possible. And we said, no, let's stay in California, just San Francisco, just LA, just the high-end stores. And we did a ton of demos. We were going into stores, founders in there, me, chief of staff, social media manager, everybody out in the wild, just getting feedback. What do people like about this product? Why are they buying it? Are they into the gut health? Do they care that there's nine grams of fiber? Um, and what we learned actually was vintage cola used to be called cinnamon cola. It had different packaging. Exact same formula, exact same formulation, but what we learned was 35% of consumers don't like cinnamon. Or they were expecting it to like, we had always get asked at demos, like, does this taste like fireball? You, like, you turned me off when you said cinnamon cola. It's I'm gross, happy right? Change. It's happy funny in it. retrospect, yeah. it like sounds kind of gross. And so, had we already been national at Whole Foods or like in a ton of stores, changing that would have been a nightmare. Like, absolutely, uh. pulling off the market, 
And so we were only in 300 stores at that point. So it was like really easy to make that change. So, you know, end of the first year, we, we made a decision. We're going to change cinnamon cola, vintage cola. And we also had our really good numbers in California to the point where we were able to raise a series A. So we raised 10 million then in December, 2019, we repackaged cola, called it vintage cola. Um, and what was actually really cool, and here's a good, a good answer to your question. Um, we did a pop-up store in downtown LA and like kind of a grungy part of downtown LA, there's this huge food hall in an old train station called Grand Central Market. It's very mainstream. It's literally the opposite of what you think of LA, Air One, Hollywood. Sure. It's like construction workers, tourists. It's a really sick spot. And we had like, we took over a, a space in there for 10 days. It was crazy. We spent no shit. Spent a lot of money on it. We did events every night. We did a dance class on the roof. We had influencers come. We did like a painting class, but like it put us on the map and we made a bunch of really good content about it. We shared it all across LinkedIn. That was when I kind of started getting into LinkedIn and realizing like if you post nice photos on LinkedIn, cause no one does that. Like I posted some pictures from one of our events. It got like, 30,000 views on it. It was crazy. I gotta start doing it. For free. For, for LinkedIn is the best. And you, when you think about it, who's on LinkedIn, it's all the people in our industry. Where do all the people in our industry who work at all these food and beverage brands shop? They shop at Whole Foods. They're all customers. And so it kind of became this oh. like really interesting. There's a nugget for you right there. That's a ding. Ding that one up. Because that's, <laughs> yeah, keep going. But that's like the little things that you are doing right now with Olipop that other brands aren't doing. Like who else thinks about going on LinkedIn? Yeah to promote a consumer-based good like this. Like nobody, like that's it just- kills it. The crazy. amount of times I hear from people in the industry, like I see you guys everywhere, you're killing it. Cause we share real updates. Every time we pass different milestones with our subscriber base, we share it. And people are like, how are you guys growing so fast? And we don't always give away the why behind it. People right? love the hype. Like people love, love hearing. They love hearing about when it. I, when I talk to you, first of all, I love the product, but when I talk to you about how fast you're growing, part of me is like, oh damn, now I like this even more. Like just for, you can't really describe it, but when you hear, and it's the opposite. When you hear companies not doing that well, or they're just starting up, it's your proof. perception, it's, yeah, it's your perception yeah. is so skewed. So. I've started writing in for influencer stuff and podcast reads, like starting to include the fastest growing functional beverage in America. And you hear that, I hear it on podcasts. Mm. I'm like, that, that, it's got a nice ring to it. It's got a nice ring to it. And now it's I'm like, this is gonna be good. It's, when you say Whole Foods Sprouts Kroger fastest growing in the country, like people are like, oh, this is real. They're like, oh, other people have tried this and it must be good. That's Which like yeah. something a year ago, I was constantly, even with influencers talking to people online, like they'd be like, oh, I haven't heard of this. I don't want to try it. Now I'm like in New York all last week and you say Olipop to people, like people know what it is. It's now almost it's becoming a household name in, on the coast, right? We have a lot of work to do in middle America. Like my dream is to like walk in the Veterans Association Hospital outside of Indianapolis. We've got a great customer there and say Olipop and people fall over themselves, right? We're still a long time away from that, but that's yeah, the difference from, you know, maybe here to next year where we're, you know, we've got a new flavor launching in July. We've got a grape soda that's going to launch. Oh, you told and, them. Uh, I, I thought you were going to keep that secret. It, it, we'll tell For our that. viewers only. Look at that, guys. <laughs> that's a secret. Exclusive. Uh, that's going into, well, you know, the, one of the biggest grocery store chains in the country. Um, all across middle America, southeast, midwest. And so that's for us a big, that'll be a big thing. Because we, we want to be put, we want to really put ourselves on the map in the, the middle of the country. Because that's where most of the soda, most of the pop in the country is, is right. consumed. That's, yeah, like, a, that's exactly it. Mo where most people are really killing themselves with these sugary drinks right. and, and, and sodas. Number one and thing bought with food stamps, soda. Number one source of added sugar in the diet, soda. You know, how do we conquer that? And it's like, Ben, you talk to Ben, like he wants to like change like the, the food system. He wants to change like, if you take, draw a line to it, like so, soda causes all sorts of healthcare and Medicaid issues in our country. And like, if you can re reverse it from the inside out and like, we look at LeBron James all the time. LeBron James paid millions of dollars a year to market 75 gram of sugar Mountain Dew to kids. Like that's fucked up, Disgusting. right? And he could have, he could do so much damage. He could do so much good with his platform. And so our whole thing is like, let's go into the schools. Like, let's go into like, where does this start? Why are there Coca-Cola vending machines in every school in America? It's screwed up, right? And kids get hooked on this stuff when they're young. So like, that's where we want this thing to, to go ultimately. Your, your mission is just huge. Like, that's the thing that I think is super appealing to me. It's like, yeah, you're, you're a, a tonic brand, but you're really trying to change the world, yeah. which is like, empowering and especially me being an influencer that, that represents you guys like that makes me want to do this even more you yeah. know what i mean i i, so I genuinely... always love to talk to our content partners because i i want to explain to them what we're trying to do we're not some hokey poke brand chasing some trend and just trying to get product out to healthy people we're like no we we really want to be a pioneer and lead the way and you talk to ben like ben's a he's a science genius he, like he you're like oh this guy could change the world and david's like the smartest market i've ever met you, you meet them you're like 
oh, these guys can do it. And they're not, they're not caught up in money. They're not caught up in like what that could mean. It's like, how do we do the most good? And it shows in the branding and the marketing and the cre creative and the way we communicate. Like most brands are just chasing an exit. Yeah. And these VC backed businesses, they want to sell the Coke and Pepsi. That's all they're engineered for. But there's no brand DNA there. You can, right. I can see right through it. Whereas with us, it's like, no, there's a thing. There's a team. I've never seen anything like our team. Like every single person is so obsessed with what we're doing. We're all best friends. When we get together, we are all in love with each other. It's got a cult vibe for sure. A it cult, does. A good cult. A you have a Facebook vibe. group about we Olipop. Have, we have that, that, so he, somebody else, not even Steve, invites me to a private Olipop Facebook group. <laughs> and I asked Steve about it. He didn't start it. Somebody else loved Olipop so much that they started a Facebook group about it. Olipop Nation. Shout out never, Greg Thompson. I've never heard of something like that. It, it, it blew my he, mind. He's and, an old family friend who's actually a great crazy. case study of a guy who absolutely lives in Philadelphia. He... Guy's never eaten a salad in his life. Like he is the has the most unhealthy diet you can have. He used to love soda. Came out to visit me in LA, and I, I, I had to like force him to try it. I'd like trick him really? into it. And now he's like totally hooked. He's like our biggest customer. He he did that without me. He was just like I love this product. I, there's, I, I want more people like me to get involved because we're like we're huge on Instagram. Right, we're doing stuff like you do on TikTok, but like. That like older audience on Facebook, like hard to reach, honestly. Yeah. And he's getting this this group. It's like five, six hundred people now, and they're obsessed Nuts. with the product. It's it's awesome. So that's he's really a great cool great stuff. human. I love that guy. Yeah, and yeah, that, I mean, again, that's the difference. And and like you said, you guys are more focused on the input instead of the outcome in terms of money. And the money is following and will follow when you guys do something this great. Um, so yeah, let's let's dive into a bit more about I guess our relationship and how we met because I think it's super important. Um, you know, from like an advice standpoint, whether you're a brand looking to find influencers or an influencer looking to align with the right brands. I actually didn't reach out to you. I think I had some, my, my manager reach out. What was your, I guess, first thought in terms of us? And then I'll, I'll sort of backpedal and tell you about how I felt about it. Yeah, so I do... Among other things, I kind of manage all of our talent and influencer partnerships, and it's our it's actually our largest bucket of spend on the acquisition side every month. We spend more on influencers than we do on Facebook, which I think surprises people. Wow. Um, and I, I actually like when influencers reach out to us, because I can A, look and see in our influencer pl management platform if they've ever posted about us before, which is very important. We want people that already know the product, are buying it sure. them, with their own dollars, and you know have, have talked about it positively. And then we're also looking to like diversify our, our content partners away from just, you know, we've done a very good job. We've worked with like every, you know, millennial, you know, white female wellness blogger in sure. the country, all the bachelor girls, um, shout out to Dylan and Hannah. But, um, yeah, like two guys in Jersey, a guy and his dad <laughs> making cocktails, like super different. Right. And we also like, we have people writing in all the time. Your product's great with cocktails. Why don't you guys talk about that more? something that we'll, we'll do more of in the future. But I was just like, this is perfect. Like Jersey, so far from LA. Um, and I was like, yeah, let's chat. And I looked at the content. The content's great. There's real engagement there. There's so many people, especially on Instagram. Like I look at two posts. I'm like, oh, you have a million followers and you get 200 likes. Like, no, we're not going to work with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you guys had real authentic content, real engagement. And like, it's, it was perfect. It was perfectly aligned. Then we hopped on the phone and um, I guess for a little bit of background for people who don't know Johnny, him and his dad have a TikTok called Johnny Drinks where they just make amazing TikTok cocktail content. And they started it March 2020 last year. And yeah. they posted a random drink of his, his dad making a drink, going out to dinner right at the beginning of the COVID. And it exploded. And now they've got almost a million followers on TikTok and crazy <laughs> awesome engagement. I, I love it. It's awesome. they, we've been doing weekly videos with them featuring different Olipop cocktails now for almost two months. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just like, when we hopped on the phone, it was just like, they get it. I totally got it. I was like, new audience. I just honestly look for people who know and like the product and are flexible and easy to work with and are fairly priced. That's like what I'm looking for. And like every person I, like, I find that I'm like that, like let's do a deal. Let's, let's yeah. do it and let's practice and see how it goes. And you guys have been amazing to work with and here we are. Oh, listen, I, I We I talked about this that. the first phone call, remember? I said, I'll, I'll be in New Jersey at the end of June. Let's oh do yeah, let's that do was the first Zoom. We're like, yo, we have to get a podcast going. So that, yeah, I mean, that's exactly how, so I've been, you know, I, I have a family friend of ours, Jordan, shout out, who's been helping with management. And interestingly enough, you know, we, we talked about how she can help with brand deals and some other, you know, social media content. And the first deal she brought to me was Olipop. So she reaches out to me, she's like, hey, this company called Olipop wants to work out a deal with you. And I'm like, wait, like Olipop, like the, you know, Olipop, because I've heard of the brand and I've seen it in, in Whole Foods. I'm like, there's no way, like, how'd you get connected with them so fast? 
And then I realized it was real and I hopped on the call with Steven and I was just talking to Steven about this before. He was the first phone call that I had with a brand that was just so real. Like I had not my guard or walls up, but I had to act professional. So I was speaking in different, you know, in a, in a different tone than I normally do. And I get in the Zoom call, I think he has like a backwards hat on. He's like, yo, what's up? I'm like, what's up? <laughs> he like walks away from the camera at one point to like fix something and like he's screaming to me from like the other side of the room. I was like, what is going on here? So then uh, I wear a cowboy hat on. Zoom yeah, yeah. Like, uh, and I was like, but that's exactly what that was. Like I was like, you know what? This dude is real. This brand is real. I can align with this. And I really want to just crush this together. So since like that day, just started off on the right foot. And like he said, here we are today, a month and a half later. It's the Jersey connection. It is, man, 100%. It's just, it's just Our VP of sales, Scott, is like the absolute man, such a legend. Jersey? Jersey guy. Hell yeah. Scott Goldstein from Scott, Monmouth County. You, he's just like, he's the best. Oh, and we, we, we got to like, meet. We got like a lot. There's a, bit, a little bit of a Jersey contingent on our team, actually. We've got yeah. a couple, couple people. Yeah. All right, so I got I to gotta dive deeper into the, uh, into the Olipop team. You plug um, this drink? Yeah, let's. So actually, I was about to pitch you. You went to the bathroom, and I was and I was hyping, hyping myself up because I'm gonna pitch you um, an idea. So we just put together Jot Ultra Coffee, another brand that Steven is a part of that we're representing. Um, Super Ultra Coffee. It's probably the best tasting instant coffee that I've ever had. By far. I've had some really shitty instant coffee. I kind of just down it, and I'm like, whatever, gets me uh, high off the caffeine. This stuff tastes really good. So we put together. Vintage Cola and Jot. He has the uh, lemon ginger and Jot, and we put a little uh, creamer in there. This thing was fantastic, okay. so fantastic that I am here today to tell you that you need to be canning this stuff. Coffee <laughs> infused, whether it's the cola or the ginger, uh, ginger lemon. I think we'd have to go ginger lemon because Coca Cola just launched last year a Coke and coffee product. So you, you don't want to, which don't they've already to... killed. They just continued it last week because it was so bad. Um, I don't know if it was bad execution or I, I tasted it. I personally didn't love it. I think the the fla the lemonade ish ginger lemon coffee like that's a thing. If you start, yeah. what's interesting is you go to nice coffee shops and you start you can see like it's leading indicators of stuff that's gonna be hibiscus has been super popular. It's coffee shops forever. Now you're starting to see it in more products and stores. And so like I was at a coffee shop in Madison this morning, Sunday Motor Co. Awesome spot. And they had a lemonade cold brew on the menu. And I was like, that's exactly what I was thinking with ginger lemon. And, and she was like, it's one of the top selling items in their store. So I'm like, oh, interesting. And she said they wouldn't do cola there, but they would do the lemon cold brew. I was like, oh, interesting. Well, they give, I mean, like in, in old school shops, like for special shops, they give you a, a piece of lemon to like, I think it's like to clean the glass. Yeah. But to get a set of lemon. Espresso so. tonic's also a thing. You just have yeah, espresso and, it is. and tonic. But tonic water has 20 grams of sugar in it. It's too like, much. This so is anyway, two grams of sugar in this. this is going to be called a Johnny Pop. We're going to make it lemon infused coffee infused with maybe a little bit of ginger, but we're, we'll talk about it off camera. That'll be your next uh, next product line, and, and we want in. So well, we'll co-launched yeah. with Johnny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Perfect. Um, so let's dive into. I guess you know you're you're obviously a huge fan of the organic marketing, influencer marketing. Talk to me about your growth. You know what you've seen since I guess day one. And you know a pivotal change where now I guess you what doubled what you've done in the past couple of years or yeah so the first year and a half of the business we were just in stores right we were traditional beverage marketing which is <clears throat> guerrilla marketing it's sampling yep. it's demos it's going to trade shows and conferences it's throwing events um, every brand for 40 years has done that right yeah. since the, the beginning of time I had this kind of vision for selling online I was just like we have a really unique product our brand is great. Mm -hmm. A very good friend who runs a massive digital marketing agency specifically for food and beverage companies. So I had him in my ear and he was just like, you guys got to be doing this. Like, it, I know it's beverage. I know it's expensive to ship. There's all these supply chain and logistical issues with shipping beverages online, but just try it out. And so after the Series A, it was kind of like, all right, this will be a project as part of the you know, post Series A. Oh. So December, you know, close the money, January, February, start getting your Facebook ads in line and getting the ad accounts all set. It was all sorts of stuff you have to do with you know, Shopify, yeah, yeah. Uh, Facebook, Instagram. And we, I think we flipped our Facebook ads on, you know, uh, uh, Valentine's Day 2020. And oh, wow. <clears throat> I remember it specifically, <laughs> one month later, March 15th, I was actually in Mexico City with Anish. And we made a bunch of changes to our website. We were selling our product for way too much online. We were charging for shipping. We were like making all the mistakes you can make. Yeah, yeah. And so March 15th, I'm um, in Mexico City. Uh, it was we like we dropped our prices by like 25%. We went free shipping. We were like, let's see if we can like 
really blow this thing out because you can always add those things back. But it was just like, let's see how this moves demand. And then March 19th, Trump declares a national state of emergency and closes the border. I literally had to leave Mexico and fly back to LA that yeah. day. And literally overnight, our volume just like exponentially increased. This was like, it happened to everyone, mind you. Like every brand that sold food or beverages online took off March, April, May last year during COVID. Right. And so we had the same thing. We grew tenfold, like, you know, from February to, to May. And then, you know, June, the world started opening back up again. It was getting warm. People weren't just on their phones 24 seven. So we kind of right. hit a wall. And so I spent like June, July, August, just like networking, just meeting with every brand that I kind of idolized online and like trying to figure out how do you scale? How do you do this with, without, you know, beyond just Facebook ads? Cause Facebook ads only get you so far. And, you know, some of the best brands I was talking to were like, yeah, influencer marketing, paid influencer marketing, which we had never paid an influencer. It was like our, I'd get on the phone and be like, yeah, we've never paid an influencer. We never will. And like multiple people were like, well, <laughs> you're an idiot. Like yeah. keep thinking that, like leave the, leave the experts to do the, the real work. And so oh, um, interesting. that's that, that was the fundamental, you know, shift in our business. So I, you know, got some recommendations <clears throat> for different agencies, met with a bunch of people, um, ended up going kind of partial agency, partial in-house and launched that, you know, our first influencer campaign in October of last year. And it just worked. Like yeah. our product was perfect for it. Um, people are, had started to hear about us enough, I think. I think if you do influencer too early, you risk people just seeing it and being like, I don't know what this is, 100%. delete. Versus like we had already, you know, at that point we were national at Sprouts. We were, we had launched in Kroger a month before. We were in most of the Whole Foods. So, you know, we were in like a couple thousand stores and people had started to hear about it. That's a... I, I want to hear the story more, but that's a really good point you brought up in, in like the pro because you, you the awareness cycle. I talk the about awareness lot, cycle, yeah. yeah. Like there are so many brands. Like the influencer marketing route is great, and I think everybody should go there eventually. But you have to start somewhere, and it's for both sides. Me as an influencer, I don't necessarily want to rep and water down my brand with a no name company. Right. And as as like you know as shallow as that sounds, it's real because when they go to check out your product and you don't have the kinks ironed out yet, your website's yeah. shit. You're not selling in any stores. It it's hand. not good for anybody. Yeah. So establish some sort of credibility first. Yeah. And especially you don't have the money to pay a legitimate, you know, for for a legit campaign. Do what you got to do first, and then spring. When I'm talking campaign. to startups or advising startups, I tell them to either go all in on retail or all in on e-commerce because you you kind of have to do one or the other. They're both expensive, right. especially on in the early days, and you kind of have to you you kind of have to go all in on one or the other. It's really hard to do, be good at both from the from the beginning. On a and I, the only caveat to that is like some of these brands can raise enough money early, hire a really good PR firm and like do a launch that's cohesive with influencers yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, and, uh, and and PR and paid ads. So like there is a way to do it, but I think if we had done influencer any earlier, we had like started selling online with influencer at the same time, like A, I would have had no idea how to do it. Exactly. And B, like, yeah. I just don't think people would have responded well to it. I don't mm -hmm. think it would have worked from a, an acquisition perspective. And so, you know, again, it was kind of lucky. It just like kind of happened. If COVID hadn't happened, none of this ever would have happened, to be honest. We kind of quickly overnight pivoted to be a digital first marketing organization from a retail first marketing organization. And it's funny because the scale of digital is so much more vast than like, think about standing in a grocery store where you're pretty much only giving out samples to like sample trolls, right? So people just want free yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Every now and then you'll get someone who's like really hooked on the product and everything. But you know, online we can like geo target people in and around the stores we're in, in Austin, Texas that do yoga and shop at, you know, the, you know, Royal Blue, Royal Blue Grocery. That's like the store that's like yeah, a cool yeah. grocery store there. Like you can't do that anywhere else. So like our this kind of like digital skill set has really expanded and it's really worked. I mean the business we we 10x growth last year. We thought we were gonna double this year and we're on pace to quadruple, which is kind of unheard of. Beverages don't grow that fast. Like wait, so wait, wait, hold on. So in three years separately, first year you oh in two years, you 10x year one, year two, and now you're four Xing the 10x year. Yeah, which you don't hear that. Usually, That's like when you 10x, then you like it's really good if you 2x from there or 3x, and we're gonna 4x. Um, it's bananas. I mean, it's crazy, and it's a, it's a confluence of like amazing team, right. incredible execution across the board. We have amazing salespeople in every major market. We've got an amazing sales org. Our supply chain team is insane. Like they've brought our price down of, of the cost to us by 30% over the last year, which is amazing because that opens up a lot more we can do from a cash perspective. Uh, and then again, this like the digital marketing really drives, really does drive the in-store stuff. And like I right. meet people 
all over the country now that are like, yeah, I heard about you from an influencer and I buy you at Whole Foods. And I'm like, great, that's what we want. That's we don't it. care if people buy online or in store. We love the data. We love the subscribers. It's great to have that every month. But ultimately, what matters down the line is that we can sell this thing you know, across the nation in all different stores, right? The, you go, how it works is you go Whole Foods Sprouts first, that's like the natural channel. And then you go into conventional grocery, which is like Safeway, Albertsons, sure. Kroger is the biggest grocery store chain in the country. We're in half of their stores now. Um, and then we also just launched a Target and 7-Eleven, and those are really good leading wow. indicators for the next wave, which is then you go Costco, Sam's Club, Walmart. Those are your big mass retailers, and then in theory, you get acquired, and the big strategics will bring you everywhere, into restaurants, into international is a huge opportunity for us. What's your data? Um, Do you have data on 7-Eleven? That's an interesting one. We just launched that two months ago. Um, okay. They're expanding us, which is the best That's indicator awesome. you could get. Right, right, it was right. really cool. I was in Washington, D.C. last week. I honestly, like, in L.A., like, I... I would never really go into a 7-Eleven. There's no really reason for me to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and but there's like they have these really awesome new age stores, and they have like this really cool um, taco shop called Laredo from Texas that they partner with on these new stores. I took a video see. going into this store in DC because I knew we were in there, and like going, me going up and buying it, and I sent it to people, and people were like, "Was that a, is that a Costco?" They were yeah, like, yeah, yeah. that's so nice. And so there's like 200 of these new ones in the Mid Atlantic, so we're in all those stores. Um, Seven One's really, really interesting. Like, keep I would say, like, keep an eye on it. They're really young team now. They're really innovative with how they're thinking about it. There's lots of technology behind it. They do a ton with delivery. The store was nice. This was like a legit nice store. It's not like your junky Seven Eleven you yeah, might yeah. think of. Uh, Marissa, Marissa Bertha, her team is is amazing. They do all this. They also invest in brands. So they Seven Eleven does. So they're like, if brands do well in their stores, they'll actually come in and, and, and invest, which is, is which is interesting. Is that why you'll see some brands will have like a Seven Eleven logo? I'm assuming they like partner or, or invest in these, like on like, the actual product. Because I've seen, yeah, like they'll sell them obviously in Seven Elevens, but they'll be like a branded product. And then it'll be like a 7-Eleven. So that's that's more so they probably collaborated with 7-Eleven to make a flavor right, okay, or a line gotcha. extension specific to the store. Um, but I don't know. Maybe they've invested in those. They're very hush-hush with who they've invested yeah, yeah, yeah. in. So, so th yeah, really cool stuff. So again, we talked about this extreme, crazy growth from year one, year two. What are your plans if there are like plans to shift? Are you just going to stay consistent with what's going on now for the years to come? Or... What does that I mean, look like? we have people are always bugging me about international and goo alcohol, and like we have so much room to do just this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we're staying in soda, we're not gonna do booze, we're not gonna go international. We're only in 7,000 stores. There are 40,000 grocery stores in the country, and there's 240,000 convenience stores. Okay, wow. that's a f crazy stat, right? 70% of drinks in the country are sold in convenience stores. We're in 200 of them with 7 Eleven, right? So just there alone, there's you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of business. Um, what I would say and what I'm primarily focused on is what we call expanding the tent or expanding the pie. So we, for, for women 24 to 48, high household income, shop at Whole Foods Sprouts and do yoga, we crush, right? That's our core market. Almost every health and wellness product, that's their core market. Um, and then like, how do you get outside of that? How do you get to their husbands and their boyfriends and their fathers? And how do you get to, you know, construction workers and, 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 and mainstream consumers, like how do you do that? And so that's really what I'm focused on. That's like my personal mission every sure. day is, okay, we have this bread and butter that we know works and you can build a big business there, but that's a 25 to $30 million business. 100 million is mainstream middle America. There's very few beverage brands who crack 30. There's a lot of brands who do really well at Whole Foods and Sprouts. They blow up, raise a bunch of money. A lot of the kombucha brands this has happened to. Yeah. They get to 25, 30 million, they get into 5,000 stores, but when they try to go from 5,000 to 25,000 stores, try to go from 25 million to 100 million, they fail. Because they go, you know, they're selling their $4 fizzy drinks in Walmart where no one pays any more than $2 for any drink. And that is just a disconnect. And so we're trying to be $2 long term when we get into those accounts where we can compete with the Cokes and Pepsis of the world. Because right, right. we're not really competing. As much as we want to be competing with Coke and Pepsi, and we sort of price. are a bit, like we're very rarely going like head to head with them in most accounts, which in Walmart, you're, you're doing that, so. Yeah, in terms of like pricing and stuff like that. That's, that's why that's, I love like working with you guys. And we just launched this commercial with Kenny Mayne. He's like, Kenny Mayne's a sports center anchor, just stepped down, shouted us out on a podcast. I tweet at him, shot a commercial with him two weeks later, ran the commercial within a month. Like all wow. in one month, all the way around. And he is like, if you pull, you know, 100 males, you know, 28 to 55 in this country who watch sports, 99.8% of them will know who Kenny Mayne is. Yes. Yeah. He's, he's an icon. He's a yeah. sports legend. And so for us, that was such a great, 
organic partnership. He shouted us out. He's been drinking it it's on subscription for the last six months. He used to drink Coca-Cola. His story is perfect. He's hilarious. We've never done anything really with comedy. Um, so for me, that's an amazing tent expander. It's guys who would never be paying attention to us otherwise, but when they're watching the Masters or when they're watching the Olympics this summer and they're on Peacock streaming or NBC streaming and they get a Kenny Main ad and he's talking about this soda, they're going to watch it. Oh, yeah. They're not going to look away from the, the camera when Kenny Main's on TV. Yeah. So for us, that was like an unbelievably perfect partnership. He's also the man. I like totally love the guy. We're doing a bunch of other cool stuff with him now, too. And you would have never even known him if he didn't just reach out, right? Like, I would never have thought to reach out to him. Yeah, he said, shouted us out on a podcast and had like a dozen people sent it to me. I actually didn't even listen to it the first time someone sent it. I was like, oh, some, I, we had stuff like that all the time, right? People would mention you here and there and like, then someone was like, you really should listen to it. It was like a really authentic shout out. And I listened, I was like, holy shit, that was like an ad read. I think that, I mean, it, we're, and I want to ask you what you think makes you guys so special, but I know what makes you guys special from the outside. And for from you know you as an individual, number one, you seize opportunities, right? Like other brands might have seen that in a podcast, say, "Hey, wow, that's great, thank you so much, Kenny," and would have never went a step further to say, "No, we need to shoot a commercial with him. We have to get him involved." But you have been a master networker in terms of you have your own experience that you've learned from and what to do and what not to do, but you're pulling from other brands, and sometimes people feel the sense of like competition where no, I need to learn for myself, and I don't want to introduce this idea to anybody else you put you know you, you have your walls down in a sense where you're okay with reaching out to other people and learning from them which i think is fantastic and you're always going to try new things and be innovative so again for me looking in that's what i see you guys are innovators you guys learn from other people but you know where you're better and just are doubling down on that so you read the book steal like an artist have i know incredible steal it's, like about an artist. How, it's about art and how like Every artist ever has built another artist, right? They're, everyone is pulling. Art is a loose term, right? Any musician, sure, everyone sure, has sure. an influence. Everyone has influences. Everyone is like, oh, I pick a little bit of style from this. Any DJ you talk to, right? There's no, nothing's really truly original, right? And so, like, yeah, am I going to pick up on different e-commerce tactics from different other brands? Of course. Yeah. Do I do the same thing? Do, if an influencer does a really good job for us, and I've got a couple of friendly brands who aren't competitive, of course I'm going to share that with them, right? Yeah. Because like rising tide lifts all boats, right? We want as many people thinking and talking about health and wellness products as we can. That's good and point. that's how I kind of view this. It's the same thing with our competitors. We have a bunch of kind of very competitive products in this like healthy functional soda space, but you need that. Coke wouldn't be Coke without Pepsi and Pepsi wouldn't be Pepsi without Coke. You need, at Whole Foods, you need like six brands to be a category. And to be a category, you get an entire cooler of space. And like, we're not gonna get an entire Olipop cooler. We need five to six other healthy sodas to get a whole mm. cooler, which we should take from kombucha, right? Kombucha is declining and there's multiple coolers for kombucha now. And so we're kind of making the case that like, we need other good functional soda brands. We need them to taste good. We need them to play nicely with us. Cause like ultimately we're all rowing the boat in the same direction. If, so, if somebody comes into healthy soda space and tastes like shit and someone tries that product and they're like, oh, I'm never having healthy soda again. That's bad for everybody. Right. Uh, and it happens with some kombucha products that just don't taste that good. You're, and, yeah, uh, no, that, that's, that is a super, I guess, different you know, perspective on starting a company like this is like, not only are you trying to increase your size or uh, of the slice of the pie, you're trying to increase the size of the pie itself, which is a fantastic way. I think the uh, best thing that could ever this. happen for us is if Pepsi launched a fiber soda because they would spend hundreds of millions of dollars marketing it. it God space. forbid they call it prebiotic and so they can educate millions of consumers around the country what prebiotic means right. and introduce them to it. We'd right. love that. I'd welcome that. That'd be amazing. We'd yeah. ride those coattails all day because it probably wouldn't taste great. <laughs> it probably would screw the execution up and then people be like, oh, prebiotic and then start Googling it and then we own all the SEO for it. And like there's, we know e-commerce better than Pepsi does, right? So like right. We, we would be perfectly positioned for that. You're in the weeds. Like there's just so yeah. gigantic that they wouldn't be able to handle that. So yeah, I mean, like I asked before, give me your, you know, why you guys, why you think you, you as a team um, are doing so well and are going to continue to do so well. So the product's amazing, right? Number like one. you can't fake that. No one can copy that. Um, the product is incredible. You can do all the great marketing in the world. If you get someone to buy it once, they'll come back end all be honest. But there's a problem with a lot of health and wellness products. People want to give it a shot and then it just doesn't taste as good as their yep. alternative. They don't come back. Um, the branding is incredible, right? People all the time I ask, why Where? Why did you buy it? They're like, oh, it's cute packaging and it tastes good. Um, so that's like kind of the table stakes I, almost, I would almost say. Like that's what you absolutely need. Right. And that gets you from like zero to 10 million in revenue. 
And then where a lot of businesses break is culture and team where mm. the founders may be awesome, but they're maybe visionaries. And they're not great managers of people and they bring in people and then things start to fray. Um, seen it a million times. Uh, we have the best team, the best team chemistry, the best culture I've ever seen. Like we do these offsites once a month in different cities where we get like the marketing team together or the sales team together. And it's just like, it's like a party. Everyone's like a, literally obsessed with each other. They love being together. We all feed off each other so well. Everyone's a player. Like you, getting a job at Olipop is very difficult now. You go through eight rounds of interviews. There's a whole psycho no psychological shit. side. There's the kind of operational side. We're really looking for people who, um, yeah, we obviously want diversity of thought and experience, but like we also want no bad eggs. We, there's certainly a no asshole policy. Like, Everyone is obsessed with each other. It's amazing. It's like the coolest thing in the world. It's like the best family you could ever you could ever ask for. But also, we work so well together. No one works their ass off. It's not like we're not grinding. But it doesn't feel like work. work like no. no one would say like this is work. They're like we're building a freaking empire here, and it's amazing. And it's just it all flows from the top. The founders are incredible. Our chief of staff is amazing. She kind of runs all the hiring and the culture stuff. Um, that's to me. And I've been you know in in analyzing brands for seven years and seeing the RX bars and the Sir Kensington's of the world that have scaled and sold, like the common thread in every single business that I've seen be successful in this space, beyond good product, good brand, is is team and culture. Because the thing is, there's a lot of good businesses now, so if your culture sucks, good people will leave. If you're a good, a top performer, and you could go make more money and go get a better culture at somebody, somewhere else, you're gonna leave. We've had zero people leave the company out of 40, which is unheard of, right? That's statistically almost impossible. Um, we've had a couple, we've, we, you know, like for performance reasons, but right, right, right. Um, that's a wild stat, right? And it's like, it's, people love it. People love working. Here. Every single person comes in, they're like, I knew, I thought it was going to be great, but like usually the things that seem good are never going to be that good. And then I got here and it's even better than I expected. And we're like, hell yeah. That's right. what we want. That's what we want people to say. <laughs> how, how did you guys keep, or I guess start that culture and maintain that culture? Um, pretty consistently because like that that's insane that everybody is so obsessed yeah with this I, company. I, part of it is the hiring process like they Ben and David will weed you out if you don't fit <laughs> like there's just so much so many questions I could ask so many different people you talk to like so that's definitely part of it um, they also had come off of a culture in their last business that kind of got taken over by some pretty bad investors mm. and they they saw how bad it can get when culture gotcha. gets bad and they were like we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen here um, it's also interesting. We've been remote since day one. So the two founders lived like two hours apart in, in NorCal. And, you know, the first three of us, kind of first three employees were all in Southern California. So we would get together once a month in either city. And it was like this kind of like every, same thing I was saying before. It's like this is like this little love fest for two days. We're all together. We get a lot done. And then, you know, I kind of stood up slack right at the beginning. I'm like a big slack guy. And we were early on Zoom and just like it just kind of worked. And then you hire salespeople around the country. So you don't need an office. And it's just kind of permeated through, and we are now built as this like remote culture that just that just kind of works. But it's it's something you can't fake. Right? I just yeah. think it's how Ben and David are. They don't take themselves too seriously. They're not micromanagers. They fully believe in like hiring great people and letting them go. It's something that I've seen at, at past companies I've worked at where they're you know the founders are amazing salesmen. They bring in amazing hires, and then they micromanage them. It's often like the gift and the curse of like the founder mentality is like. You want to control everything, and it's really hard to delegate. But Ben and David did an amazing job of, of doing that. So. Yeah. So they're just super real. No one's and, micromanaged. Yeah. yeah. Not, not at all. And not and not afraid to show off their culture. I think that's a big one. I think a lot of founders in their early hiring, they don't want to upset anybody because if it's for example a great hire, but maybe they don't match or fit the mold of the culture, they're like, oh well, that's okay because he's you know or she is super imperative to our yeah. our growth, and it's really not. It's the opposite. So they I guess know when to let go and just really build that. Um, sound culture, which I think is amazing. Another point that I want to mention, as an influencer, if you're looking for brands to align with, find the ones with culture like this. Because like we talked about, we're going to the business side of things. Yes, there's a lot of money to be made in this space of you know being an influencer. What you don't want is to become that cash grab guy or girl, right? To make the quick buck. There is no long term in that. So find these brands that are doing it right, that you can align with, that you feel that culture, that you can be a part of, and stick with them, have those long-term agreements um, and relationships as opposed to just, like I said, being super broad. So. I try to interview every influencer we work with before we sign anything. You should. Because you can tell uh, right away if they're there for the right reasons, if they've actually had the product. Like I generally won't work with you if you haven't had our product. You have the day I, like I want you to find it organically, I want you to get it, I want you to actually be a customer. How, you can't, that's, again, and, and sorry for cutting you off, but like that's the organic and, and realness, it's the same shit with, 
uh, posting a video. Like for me, when I post an, an either it's an ad or it's a video I just don't feel like doing or my dad's not in the mood, the video doesn't do well ever. Yeah. Like it's very obvious when yeah. we're just sort of doing it to do it. When we believe in something, you feel that, you sense it through the camera, which I think is super yeah. powerful. I, I review all of our influencer content through our agency and I every single time, almost to a number, can predict how many orders they're gonna do. And there's some that like, they hit all the check boxes, they technically met the criteria, and I like begrudgingly approve it because I know it's not gonna perform. Yeah, I just, you can just tell they were in a bad mood that day, they were just doing it, they were knocking out 10 videos in a row, and it drives me nuts. We actually had a ba huge back and forth with a massive influence last week, like a significant five figure check. And wow. the first round, like no one, no one goes back with, with her. Like it's like one of those, like, if she's in, she's in. And I was like, I'm not approving this. No. It was terrible. And her second rendition was like a little better. She did. She did, ended up doing better than I thought, actually. But I, I'm at we're at the point now. Where I don't have to pay anyone. Like I, if I don't like it, I'm not gonna like. If I, I think it's gonna be a waste of money and, and time on our end. I'm like, I'd rather not work with them. You have the leverage. Um, we have all the leverage. Yeah, yeah. We don't. We don't. There's no one that we need, right? Of course. And, you know, I'd love to work with Justin Bieber. If Justin's listening, can right. touch, Justin, cut us a slack. I'm sure he's watching this. Yeah. Right? He's, no, he is. He's, he's a subscriber. Yeah. But I mean, that's you have the leverage, and now influencers, if they're not already are gonna flock to you. Just like they flock to Celsius and bang, like this is the next one up in terms of the creative campaign. And in my opinion, I think we're gonna see in the next one to two years, everybody's on this wave. And every time they see an influencer, their favorite influencer's, influencer's gonna be- It's so funny how many influencers I've talked to now, like since we started doing the influencer marketing last October, where at the beginning, like most people didn't know who we were. And now I'm like, it's like swatting flies. Like, oh, I've seen you work with all of my friends. Like. We've done some work with the girls from The Bachelor, and now like the new season of Bachelor comes, and we just like boom, top three girls from the show, sign them up. Like That's we awesome. know that audience cranks for us, so it's like I have a playbook now, and I know who works, and I know who you should work with, and it's fun because I can go direct to them. Um, it's the beauty of Instagram. Yeah, to get in the DMs. Warm intros. I mean, like I said, my network is your network, and now right. I believe in the product. I can you know send right. it over to people that I know. Also and the likewise, product. got Jot in the mix now. That's yeah. it, man. Yeah, Jot is uh, a little, a little web of Stephen Vigilante. Yeah, yeah. You got <laughs> Madre Mezcal. People. We're gonna get you involved. With Shout out Madre there. Mezcal. We're gonna be uh, trying that one out very soon. So stay tuned on that it's one. It's the it's the the mezcal for people who don't like mezcal. It's not too smoky. It's delicious. Ooh. It also mixes very well with ginger lemon and lollipop. We're gonna leave that cliffhanger there, so we won't talk much more about Madre <laughs> until maybe a couple different episodes. So, um, Steve, this has been awesome. Probably my favorite podcast to date. Um, Can't wait to get this out in the world. Yeah, th this is this is really fun, guys. So I appreciate if you guys are listening, share it with a friend, subscribe to our YouTube. We're on Apple um, Podcasts, we're on Spotify, obviously on TikTok and Instagram. So thank you, Steve, again for joining us today. If there's anything you want to, Steve Vigilante on LinkedIn, Stephen Parker on Instagram. All right. Drink Olipop on Instagram. Drink Olipop. Keep calm and drink Olipop. That's like my little. Keep. We, do you have t-shirts? I don't. But then we we're we're gonna get t-shirts. So I want to do a soda for breakfast campaign too. Just noodle on that. Like it's the only soda you could drink at 10 a.m. We just did. Like our orange squeeze has nine grams of sugar, has 160 or sorry, nine grams of fiber, two grams of sugar, five grams of sugar, nine grams of fiber, 160 percent of your daily vitamin C. It's like the best orange juice you could ever drink with 80 percent less sugar than normal orange juice. I just did, I ran out of orange juice the other day. Drank an orange squeeze. It's also I the best when you're hungover. Everyone mess, has <laughs> people love orange squeeze when they're hungover. I don't know what it is, but any time of the day. We're gonna do that. That'll yeah. be a campaign. So we'll, uh, we'll get that going. Guys, thank you again. Cheers. We'll be back very soon.